interns from the MCCDC. Um, and then we'll have a raffle at the end for those in-person participants. So yes, if you have any questions, um, I see we already have um, a comment from Micaela. Yes, it's so great to see you. Thank you for joining. Um, but yes, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen should be around the center. And then if you have any comments or um, thoughts, reactions, feel free to put those in the chat. The chat will be our main, um, our main communication and engagement space.
Thank you so much, Roger. Welcome everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and get started now since it is 3.07. Thank you all for coming here today. My name is Leila Tamale and it is with great joy and honor that I welcome you to the Rise and Revolution Conference, the first of its kind at the College of San Mateo and hopefully the first of many. As a Tongan woman, it is my honor to offer a a traditional acknowledgement and expression of respect to ground this sacred space. Malo Aupito Pauline Fonua, my Ofakitonga family, for providing me with a template for this fakatapu and for fostering a safe space within which myself and others can reconnect with our Tongan language and culture. I'm still a student of my Tongan language, so please forgive any errors. Malo elau malie, gole ke o hufanga, he talamalu o e fonua o ramaitush aloni. Fakatapu ki he pule, ako oku mea, President Jennifer Taylor Mendoza, mohaa Dr. Mikaela Ochoa. Fakatu lo, atu kia hapoto, mohaa ako anga, College of San Mateo. Leve leva e malanga ga u tatao atu. Kai ata. Mooku a e fainga malia ni. Greetings. I ask to be excused and pay my respects to the customs and culture of this land, which is Ramaitush Aloni land. I ask to be excused and pay my respects to the administrators who are here President Jennifer Taylor Mendoza and Vice President of Administrative Services, Micaela Ochoa. I ask to be excused and pay my respects to the educators and to this place of learning, the College of San Mateo. Thank you for your time and attention and for giving me the space and opportunity to speak now. I'd like to again call attention to the people whose land we are hosting this conference on and recognize that the College of San Mateo sits on the unceded territory of the Ramatush Ohlone, the original peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. The ancestral land of the Ohlone, the, the ancestral land of the Ramaytush includes what is colonially known as San Francisco County, San Mateo County, and part of Santa Clara County. Due to Spanish and Mexican colonization and the U.S. settler projects propelled by Manifest Destiny and anti-indigeneity, the ancestors of the present-day Ramaytush Ohlone were forcibly removed from their lands. 75% of that population was lost as a result of these genocidal efforts, and the remaining were forced into poverty, resulting in one surviving lineage that comprises the four branches of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples today. Today, the Ramaytush Ohlone do not have ownership over any of their ancestral lands. We recognize that every member of the College of San Mateo community has and continues to benefit from the occupation of this land since the institution's founding 100 years ago. Please join us in recognizing and honoring their ancestors, descendants, elders, and all other members of the Ramaytush Ohlone community. One way you can do this is by supporting the nonprofit work of the Association of Ramatush Ohlone by paying Yunakin land tax. I come to you today as co-lead organizer of this conference, as scholar intern for the Multicultural and Dream Center, as a student in the Mana learning community, and as an indigenous woman who understands that the road ahead towards our liberated future is a long and arduous one but one that we will journey together, that we will journey through together nonetheless. We hope that the RISE conference can be a place of critical learning, growth, and accountability as we reflect on the interconnected systems of oppression, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, the incarceration system, capitalism, settler colonialism, climate injustice, and so much more that plague our societies and how we can mobilize to dismantle these systems and achieve collective liberation. Thank you again for being here and I'll pass it to my wonderful colleague, Brittany. Thank you so much, Leila. Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Ariharan and I'm so excited to welcome you to the Multicultural and Dream Center's first annual social justice conference. I am a scholar intern at the Multicultural Dream Center, otherwise known as the MCCDC. And this is a position that has provided me with the opportunity to co-lead this conference alongside Leila. 
And we can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to join us as we rise in revolution. The fact that you are here today is a testament to the to your commitment and willingness to learn about and be a part of a movement that aims to transform our respective campuses and communities. So we urge you to relish in this empowering and radicalizing space to use this as an opportunity to ask questions and grow and to realize the impact and value of your demands and actions. I also wanna take this opportunity to share a few housekeeping rules for our virtual conference. So please engage in the chat. This is a space where we would love to hear your thoughts and reactions. And as for questions, please direct all of those both throughout the sessions and during the Q&A portions to the Q&A function in Zoom, which we will be monitoring regular, regularly. And please continue to register for sessions and invite all your friends to um, our conference. We are so proud and excited to be able to bring to you an array of amazing speakers and leaders whose advocacy work serves as a model and inspiration for the themes and values of our conference. Scholars like Dr. Angela Davis, Dr. Lenata Warjak, Deshaun Harrison, and many more have prepared for us presentations and workshops that will encourage us to engage in meaningful discussions and critically reflect on how we can effectively use our positions as students, staff, and faculty members to rethink practices and policies and how they can either positively contribute to or threaten social justice initiatives. We hope this inspires you to propel the shift from liberal demands to radical and revolutionary change. And this conference is also an opportunity to celebrate the College of San Mateo's centennial legacy. As a college, appro college approaches 100 years of educating students, we not only gather here to celebrate this centennial legacy, but we also hope to recognize and hold accountable its role in the systems and institutions that are inherently oppressive in their practices. When we think about the College of San Mateo's history, we can overlook the fact that the college is what it is today, largely due to the dedication and work of Black, Indigenous, and other students of color in the late 1960s and throughout its 100 years. We want to spotlight the work of those brave CSM students and faculty members, such as Robert Hoover and Aaron Manganiello, who risked suspension and being silenced, all in the name of community empowerment. And we hope this isn't the last we see of you all. This conference will be happening all week in a hybrid fashion as we will be streaming all session, sessions and offering in-person viewing parties at the CSM campus. So we invite you to join our other daily sessions as we explore topics related to disability justice, building movements, abolition, and conclude with an in-person celebration of joyful resistance through art. And I will now pass it over to my supervisor, Jackie Santiso, who will be speaking a little bit about CSM's Multicultural and Dream Center. Thank you so much. Oh, we are so proud to have students like Layla, Brittany, and all the students that are helping us volunteer up in 468. And if you haven't already checked it out, please continue to join us on the fourth floor of Building 10. Um, but as Brittany said, in honor of the CRP legacy, the MCCDC continues to support students of color and the tradition of being active change agents of their community. Our center has expanded services in the 1960s to explicitly support undocumented mixed status students, LGBTQIA students, former foster youth, and ESL students through various services. Some of our ongoing programs include our scholar internship program, our academic case management program, and social justice events like today's Rise and Revolution conference and our fantastic student podcast at the root. Through our Dream Center services, we have a legal partnership with the Immigration Institute of the Bay Area for free legal consultations three times a week. Eligible clients can receive up to $495 to go towards any USCIA application, as long as they use our services. This could be residency, citizenship applications, and of course, back applications, to name a few. For our graduating and transferring and documented students or students from mixed status families across the district, we invite you and we would love to celebrate your end of year accomplishments through the migration celebration. And more details about all of the events and programs are linked in the chat or check out our websites. And finally, follow us on Instagram at CSM underscore MCCDC or visit us in person at the center at College of San Mateo, Building 10, Room 180 during operating hours and hangout. Thank you all. Thank you, Jackie. So now it is my great honor to introduce our first speaker, Kathy Jetnell-Kitchener. 
Kathy is a poet of Marshall Islands ancestry who currently serves as climate envoy for the Republic of the Marshall Islands Ministry of Environment. She is also an artist, performer, and educator. She received international acclaim through her poetry performance at the opening of the United Nations Climate Summit in New York in 2014. In February of 2017, the University of Arizona Press published her first collection of poetry, Iyip Jaltuk, Poems from, Marshallese from a Marshallese Daughter. Kathy also co-founded the youth environmentalist nonprofit Jojikum, dedicated to empowering Marshallese youth to seek solutions to climate change and other environmental impacts threatening their home island. She received her master's in Pacific Island Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and is currently a PhD student at Australia National University. Kathy Malo Enawe, thank you for the great work that you do. Take it away. Okay, great. Um, share my screen now. Sorry, Kathy, I think there might be um, a slight audio problem. Would you mind maybe muting and then try unmuting again? Okay, yeah, sure. I'll just mute because I have it because of this. I don't think I'll stop. Um, it's a little uh, like warbly. Um, Roger, do you have any suggestions? Could you use possibly your computer speaker or a computer microphone? You have a computer microphone, if possible, or your. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. That's unfortunate. I was hoping to use this because I'm calling from our youth center. So um, I'll slow down a little bit. So Yahweh Alib, um, I'm calling in from the Marshall Islands. So as they said, my name is Kathy Jirungu Kachinov. Um, I'm a, a Marshall Islands poet and also climate envoy and director of the nonprofit Jyotigum. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to be just talking a little bit about my work and also a little bit of background about what the Marshall Islands has gone through. So most of my work has been informed by, um, by the history of my islands. And um, a lot of times people in the United States aren't aware of that history. So quite a lot of my work is, has been education um, and just um, raising awareness amongst folks about what the Marshall Islands looks like and what we have um, experienced. So this one, so let me just put it on so that it's, so it's a little messy right now. Uh, slideshow. Okay, so the Marshall Islands is, for those who aren't aware, located in the Northern Pacific region. Um, we're in an area known as Micronesia. Uh, so not Polynesia or Melanesia. So what mo most people are familiar in the U.S. with is uh, Polynesia. So this is Marshall Islands right up here. Um, oh, come, oh, there. So these are all of our different island chains. There's over 24 atolls. And the island that I'm located in is called Medoro, which is right here, the capital city. And that's where I'm calling you all from today. Um, the islands are, we're one of the few atoll nations in the world. There's like four coral atoll nations. So atolls are a specific type of island. Um, and this will be important for you all to know when I speak a little bit later about um, the effects of climate change, which is entirely my work. Um, so the Marshall Islands, as you can see, is only two meters above sea level. So the other atoll nations includes the Maldives, Kiribati, um, to Valu and also Tokelau is um, a state, but also their own island nation. So um, 
Atoll nations are incredibly vulnerable, as you can see, but we're also really resilient. Um, we are one of the largest ocean states in the world. So we like, so we're mostly surrounded by ocean. Um, after World War II, the U.S. liberated us uh, from uh, Japan. So the U.S., uh, a lot of World War II took place in the Pacific, as some of you may know, and they tested over 60 nuclear weapons during that time. Not during World War II, sorry. Um, after World War II, the U.S. liberated us, and then we became a trust territory of the United States, and then they began to test over 60 nuclear weapons in our islands, the big of, biggest one of which is the Bikini Bomb. Um, I mean, the... Uh, the Bravo bomb, which was detonated in Bikini Atoll, and that was over 1,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. So a lot of my work has been all about raising awareness on this legacy of nuclear testing. Um, and so I'll share the first poem video that I did. So usually what I do is I um, create poetry and I also create poem videos, raising awareness on how what we've experienced. Um, and so the first poem video was done about three years ago, and it's called Anointed, and it included a journey out to Bikini Atoll and also Inuwetup Atoll. These are two islands where the nuclear testing was conducted, and um, there is a dome out there called the Runit Dome, which some people may be familiar with. It's a dome where the U.S. military basically shoveled a bunch of nuclear waste into an island that was almost entirely incinerated as a crater, and then they capped it with concrete. And to this day, it has yet to be cleaned up, and it's a nuclear waste issue. And um, it's now being affected by the rising sea level because that nuclear waste is now leaking into the ocean. So um, if you can, can uh, Layla, could you guys play the first poem video? So that's uh, well, the second, I think. It's called Anointed. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, Bala, I sent you the link. Did it come through? If not, I just shared it with you, Roger, if you're able. Oh, never mind. Thank you, Bala. I'm coming to meet you. I'm coming to see you. What stories will I find? Will I find an island or a tomb? To get to this tomb, take a canoe. Take a canoe through miles of scattered sun. Swallow endless swirling seas. Gulp down radioactive lagoon. Do not bring flowers or speeches. There will be no white stones to scatter along this grave. There will be no songs to sing. How shall we remember you? You were a whole island once. You were breadfruit trees, heavy with green globes of fruit, whispering promises of massive canoe. Crabs dusted with white sand, scuttled through pandanus roots. Beneath looming coconut trees, beds of watermelons slept still, swollen juice. 
and you were protected by powerful Eloids. Chief birthed from women who could swim pregnant for miles beneath a full moon. Then you became testing ground. Nine nuclear weapons consumed you one by one by one engulfed in an inferno of blazing heat. You became crater, an empty belly. Plutonium ground into a concrete slurry filled your hollow caverns. You became two. You became concrete shell. You became solidified history, immovable, unforgettable. You were a whole island once. Who remembers you beyond your death? Who would have us forget that you were once green globes of fruit, pandanus roots, and whispers of canoes? Who knows the stories of the life you led before? Here is the story of a turtle goddess. She gifted one of her sons, Leda, a piece of her shell and wounded cow, a leathery green fragment, hollow as a piece of bark. It gave Leda the power to transform into anything, into houses and trees, the shapes of other men, even kindling for the first fire that almost burned us alive. I am looking for my story. I look, look. There must be more to this than incinerated trees, a cracked dome, a rising sea, a leaky nuclear waste with no fence. There must be more to this than a concrete shell that houses death. Here's the story of another shell, anointed with power. Leodao used it to transform into kindling for the first fire. He gave this fire to a small boy. The boy almost burned his entire village to the ground. Licks of fire leapt from skin and bones, from strands of coconut leaves. While the boy cried, let out laugh, laugh. This is a story of a people on fire. We pretend it is not burning all of us. Here is the story of the ways we've been tricked, the lies we've been fed. Not poison Your illnesses are normal. You're fine. You're fine. My belly is a crater and your stories empty. Only question. Hard as concrete. Who gave them this power? Who anointed them with the power to burn? Thank you all. Um, I'm going to now shift into the other part of the presentation. So I'll share screen again. Um, so, oops. so that was uh, one of the last poem videos that I did on nuclear testing. And um, ever since then, the, the other thing that I've done on nuclear work, nuclear related work was an installation. So this was an art installation that is currently up. And it's about I think it's been up since in the past year. Um, it looks like it's just a pile of rocks, but <laughs> there's more to it. Um, so in the uh, uh, Queensland Art Gallery, um, they have an Asia Pacific triennial where they feature Asian and Pacific Islander artists. 
and they have um, their first exhibition on Micronesia. So um, there might be other panelists who will speak more on this, but Pacific Islanders and Asians, um, you know, Pacific Islanders tend to be a little bit subsumed within the API category. And then we, even within Pacific Islanders, um, Micronesia tends to be subsumed within Polynesia and the writer Pacific. So they decided to have a um, exhibition just about Micronesia. And so this is about section 177 of the compact. And it is a um, meditation on the loss of that section, which was um, a section that provided benefits uh, for on nuclear testing for those who were affected by the atolls, I mean, by the nuclear testing. Um, from the four specific atolls that the U.S. has deemed as affected by the nuclear testing. Oh, I'll try to slow down. <clears throat> and um, either way, uh, although nuclear testing doesn't necessarily have to do with climate justice for all of those, you know, who might be like, what does this have to do with climate justice? For those of us in the Marshall Islands, a nuclear testing legacy informs how we move forward through climate change and planning for a climate threatened future. So um, there's some really concrete examples of that that I can get into a little bit later or maybe through Q&A if you'd like to hear more about how we're incorporating that nuclear legacy into our planning stages for climate change. But for now, I just wanted to share a little bit of the work. Um, these piles of rocks in the photo are representing each of the four atolls and they're using stones that look like the stones that we put on the grave sites, um, which is a, a um, on the grave sites out here. So there's a cultural um, cultural um, ritual that we do in which we, uh, it's the third kind of portion of it. There's like a wake-like, then there's the burial, and then there's something called the um, erak, which is when we scatter white stones around a grave and it's supposed to represent a cleansing and also forgiveness. So this, um, the baskets that you see around the, the stones, you know, we invite um, participants to actually scatter stones onto those piles, and it's a, and it becomes like a participatory experience where I'm inviting um, people who come and see the exhibition to participate in this act of of forgiveness. And it's not necessarily forgiveness of the U.S. or of what the atrocities that's happened, but it's a forgiveness on our part because of the fact that we negotiated a way, we allowed the section 177 to be taken out of the second compact, which is a treaty between the United States and the Marshall Islands. So it becomes a ritual. So I see a lot of the work that I do as kind of a ritual. Um, okay, kind of a lot. <laughs> So I'm going to move into some of what the work that I do on climate change. So um, as you are all aware, we're very much um, very vulnerable to the rising sea level of the Marshall Islands. Uh, we're only two meters above sea level. And so there's no mountains or no other place to escape to should the water continue to rise. The latest IPCC reports that has been coming out throughout this past year has been really clear that things are going to get worse and they were on track to meet the um, worst case scenario. We're not at lower case scenario or you know middle, we're at high risk scenario for um, climate catastrophe. And so what climate catastrophe looks for those, for those of us in the Marshall Islands, it looks like complete loss of land. Um, because of the fact that we're only two meters above sea level by 2050 at the earliest, which is within 30 years. You know, before this, before the recent IPCC reports, we knew that we would have, you know, only a limited amount of time before this kind of irreversible impact on our islands. But now we're at the stage where it's the clock is setting back even further. So, um, you know, some of the impacts that we've seen over the years, you know, as you can see these, this like high, um, like uh, uh, king tide season, this is king tide season when the tide is at its highest, it'll crash into our homes, um, it'll flood our streets, and this breadfruit tree here will be completely brown after it'll dry out our crops. And um, there's even certain islets that are disappearing, that are no longer livable. This is an islet um, within Medoro that used to be lush. It used to have trees, 
breadfruit trees, coconut trees, and now it's just a sandbar because of the constant water and erosion. So this was just recently that, you know, we watched this and it's within 10 years. And then of course, there's also homes that are destroyed during these king tide seasons. Um, so this is my cousin's house that I took a picture of after she lost it with her permission, of course. Now, we knew this was happening and we knew it was a problem, but only recently um, a scientist came just about two years, maybe three years ago and gave a presentation to the Marshall Islands that was basically like, you don't have time. You can't wait for the world to turn around their commitments. You have to start protecting your island right now. Um, so there's a term called adaptation and how we need to start adapting physical parts of our island just to stay um, just to stay safe. So what I'm sure what this was what he showed during his presentation. So this is ca called the DUD area out here and it's you can see it's packed with houses. And this is um, what flooding would happen at only 0.5 meters of sea level rise. Um, this is at um, at one meter of sea level rise. Um, and then this is at two meters of sea level rise. That's how much flooding would take place if we keep going you know, in the direction we're going. And then this is the road. So it's just a single road and it's water all around it um, that goes between our airport. Um, so this was at 0.5 meters sea level rise, one meter of sea level rise, and then two meters sea level rise, it's completely gone. So this is an example of a possible island uh, artificial island that would be built in Kwajalein. So these are, we are now at the stage where we're considering really extreme adaptation solutions to maintain our physical existence. Um, so that includes building islands and elevating parts of islands and then also moving people um, within islands. Uh, we refuse to consider uh, all out migration. We're not gonna leave. We have to maintain our presence and our sovereignty. So that's out of the question. Um, but just keeping in mind that we have to figure out, uh, we have a lot of really complicated tasks ahead of us that includes figuring out what does the land tenure system look like? Uh, I mean, what will the land tenure system be? How will it change if we change the land? You know, because we have a really complicated land sentiment system that's rooted in the land where we have, you know, stories, legends, uh, like chants that are attached to specific parts of our land. What happens to those cultural pieces of information if we change that piece of land? Who owns that piece of land? Everyone um, owns land out here in the Marshall Islands. If your land is elevated um, and you are forcibly removed, do you still own that piece of land? You know, these are all like really big questions that we can't answer right now. And these are things that we have to consider. So the second poem video that I'm going to show is called Rise. And I wrote this poem video in collaboration with my friend Akka Niviana, who is Greenlandic. And we did this poem video right after the anointed one, the first one you saw. So what I did was I collected shells from Bigini Atoll. Um, which was the site of the nuclear testing. And then um, we and me and Akka met up in Greenland. And to be honest, it was the first time we'd ever met one another. I you know, was supposed to initially just go to Greenland and do a poem video from an ice shelf, I mean, from a, from a glacier, uh, just to you know, represent, stand on this ice that would, that would eventually melt and subsume our island. You know, it's the metaphor, what, what does it represent? You know? Um, but I didn't want to go to this land that wasn't my own without, you know, having someone there who was from that island. So that land. So I, I reached out and found this Greenlandic poet. Her name is Akka, and we're still friends to this day. But we wrote this poem video poem together in a collaboration. And it's all about connecting the melting ice from her homeland with the rising sea level on my side. And you'll see some, if you pay attention, there's some lines in there about forcing land um, out of this rising sea because it's reflecting what I had just kind of come to terms with about how we're gonna be forced to change the physical landscape of our island just to survive and just to stay above water. So uh, we can play that. Can we play that poem video now, Rise?
Sister of ice and snow, I'm coming to you from the land of my ancestors, from atolls, sunken volcanoes, undersea descent of sleeping giants. Sister of ocean and sand, I welcome you to the land of my ancestors, to the land where they sacrificed their lives to make mine possible, to the land of survivors. I'm coming to you from the land my ancestors chose. Ayankainad, Marshall Islands, a country more sea than land. I welcome you to Gadashikunan, Greenland, the biggest island on earth. With me, I bring these shells that I picked from the shores of the Indi Atoll and Runed Dome. In my hand, I hold these rocks picked from the shores of the, the foundation of the land I call my home. With these shells, I bring with me a story of long ago, two sisters frozen in time on the island of Huyai. One magically turned to stone, the other who chose that life to be rooted by her sister's side. To this day, the two sisters can be seen by the edge of the reef, a lesson in permanence. With these rocks I bring, a story told countless times, a story about Sister Ma'amna, mother of the sea, who lives in a cave at the bottom of the ocean. This is a story about the guardian of the sea. She sees the greed in our hearts, the disrespect in our eyes, every whale, every stream, every iceberg are her children. When we disrespect them, she gives us what we deserve, a lesson in respect. Do we deserve the melting ice, the hungry polar bears coming to our islands, or the colossal icebergs hitting these waters with rage? From one island to another, I ask for solutions. From one island to another, I ask for your problems. Let me show you the time. Coming for us faster than we'd like to admit. Let me show you airports, underwater, bulldozed reefs, blasted sands, and plans to build new atolls, forcing land from an ancient rising sea, forcing us to imagine turning ourselves to stone. Can you see a glacier scrum with the weight of the world's heat? I wait for you here on the land of my ancestors, hard heavy with a continuous thirst for solutions. And to watch this land will change while the world remains silent. The center of Iceland, no, I come to you now in grief. Morning landscapes that are always forced to change. First, the walls inflicted on us. Then, the nuclear waste dumped in our waters, on our ice. And now, this. Sister of ocean and sand, I offer you these rocks, the foundation of my home. May the same unshakable foundation connect us, make us stronger than these colonizing monsters that still to this day devour our lives. The very same beasts that now decide who should live, who should die. Sister of ice and snow, I offer you these shells and the story of the two sisters as testament, as declaration that despite what we are told, we will not leave. We will choose stone. We will choose to be rooted to misery forever. From these islands, we ask for solutions. From these islands, we ask, we demand that the world see beyond these SUVs, their pre-packaged convenience, their oil slip trees, beyond the belief that tomorrow will never happen, that this is merely an inconvenient truth. Let me bring my home to you. Let's watch as Miami, New York, Shanghai, Amsterdam, London, Rio de Janeiro, and Osaka try to breathe underwater. You think you have decades before your home fall beneath tides? We have years. We have months before you sacrifice us again. Before you watch from your TV screen, computer screen, to see if we will still be breathing while you do nothing. My sister, I offer these rocks as a reminder 
that our lives matter more than their power. That life in all forms demands the same respect we all give to money. That these issues will affect each and every one of us. None of us is immune. And that each and every one of us has to decide if we will rise. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. So I hope that was okay for you all. If the if it was glitchy at all, I'm not sure because it's it's a bit glitchy on my end. The videos, um, I would encourage you to watch it after if you're into it, <laughs> and uh, you can watch it more fully. Um, so those were that poem video was written for a specific campaign for 350 Pacific or 350.org, which is uh, a nonprofit on it, a nonprofit that works on um, an or in organizing. Um, they organize on climate change across the world. And I knew the founder, Bill, Bill McKibben, and he was the one that suggested it. And so that was the work that we did together. Um, and if you notice, we're exchanging gifts, which was a cultural protocol for us here in the Marshalls. You don't go to another island without bringing something, you know, like we say, man beam, like you're the front of your hand. So you give something and, and, you know, because they're welcoming you to their homeland. So that's what I did. I, I took these shells from Runit and from Begini and brought it to her and exchange, gave it to her and she gave me those stones. And that became this act of exchanging stories as, as well as exchanging our histories, our survival. I mean, it was crazy. So um, that was maybe three years ago. Uh, it was a long time ago since we did the, that poem video. Um, and my work has shifted a little bit to, since then. Uh, I'm gonna share screen again. Here we go. Um, yeah, so um, throughout that time that I was writing and performing full time, so it was about three or four years of me writing and performing full time where I was creating those kinds of poem videos. And those were the last two kind of bigger poem videos that I did. Um, I was also running a nonprofit called Jiojigum, which was I co-founded with my cousins after college back in like, I think it was 2000, I want to say 2014. It was a while ago. Um, so we've been organizing events with youth on climate change ever since. Um, so this, if you see this photo right here, this is actually from this past weekend. Um, so it's not just climate change, it's actually all environmental issues. Um, oops, sorry. It's all environmental issues. Um, we do all types of work on nuclear, on the nuclear legacy with the youth, as well as waste management. So like this past weekend, we had our first trash get ball tournament where um, we had high school students playing and, you know, we used playing a basketball tournament because basketball is huge out here. And also we contributed, you know, this waste management with uh, a, like a trash a, like well, a trash facility and you know they had to teams had to register by collecting trash so you know it was all about just kind of collect connects these kinds of issues to one another um but beyond that um i also now work as has have been working for the past about three years as climate envoy with our government and so that has meant um helping to support our government at the cop the climate of conferences um the Conference of the Parties, which is the international yearly conference on climate change under the United Nations. And so I've been representing our government at those and helping to support our negotiations um, through the UNFCCC um, and supporting our ministers and our high level leaders on our climate strategy. And then at the national front, also helping to develop our national adaptation plan, which answers some of those questions that we mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to stop now because I've been talking for a while <laughs> and uh, also just want to make sure there's time for Q&A if there is time. So I'll stop here. And um, Leela, do you want to take over? Or? Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, yeah, we can just go straight into Q&A. Um, yeah, we have a good chunk of time for that. So let's open it up um, to all of our attendees. Um, please throw your questions in the Q&A section. Again, you can find that on the bottom of your Zoom screen um, around the center where it says Q&A. Um, so go ahead and add those in there. Um, it really is a treat to have Kathy with us today. 
um, your poetry was actually um, something that I read in my first Pacific Island Studies class that I ever took. And so it's, um, it's definitely been very foundational and significant to my own um, just, you know, learning about all of these different things faced by um, Marshallese, faced by Marconesians, faced by Pacific Islanders in, as a whole. Um, we have one question in the chat so mm -hmm. far from Catherine, um, and she's asking, what was your view of COP26? Do you feel that there is a more, that there's more urgency around facing the climate crisis? Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, so COP26 was a recent um, climate conference this past November, and it took place out in um, the UK. And I, I did attend you know, with the Marshall Islands delegation. Uh, I think there is more urgency, but it's still not enough. Like um, it was kind of frustrating because at the last minute, um, some really important language got watered down when three countries, you know, three of the highest emitting nations went into the back room and negotiated a deal, um, you know, to water down that language at the last minute in the cover language. Um, and it was, you know, it's the first time that we saw fossil fuels um, being mentioned, um, being explicitly gas and coal being explicitly mentioned in the, um, in the, in the, in the cover document, the document that, that was the outcome of the COP. So that's huge. That's never been done. That's never been acknowledged before. But the bad problem was that they watered down this part of the language that said there was supposed to be a phase out of fossil fuels, a phase out of gas and coal. And instead they watered it out to watered it down to phase down, which is a very small thing, you know, as like a poet, I can really appreciate such the the nuance in the in the language in these documents. But it was also really frustrating for me as a small Pacific Island nation, you know, we're there, we're at the table. It's one of the few places where we have a seat at the table as a sovereign nation that's recognized by the United Nations. And yet it can still, you know, all this work, all this negotiations can be subsumed by one meeting in one back room in the last like four hours of the COP, which is crazy. So I think that was really deeply frustrating for me to see how incredibly flawed this system is. So I think that's might be the only thing that I would, um, that's something that I'm still reflecting on as someone who is new to that space. Um, but I, I, I think there is more of an urgency what, what in uh, that coming from the public. But I think the, you know, these politicians, uh, uh, many of the politicians, many of the highest emitting nations are still not taking the responsibility that they need to take. So yeah, thank you for that question, yeah. Um, Thank you, Kathy. Um, yeah, what a great question. I would also like to know um, that any of us, any of um, any of you guys joining virtually, can actually, um, in, if you would like to talk directly to Kathy um, and unmute, you do have the ability to do that. Um, on the left of Q and A, it says raise hand. So if you just click on that button, um, Roger will go ahead and unmute you um, or give you the ability to unmute. And you can also turn on your video if you'd like. Um, it's just a little extra way of engaging. And then I see in the chat, there is some love and positivity for you, Kathy. Um, we have a note from the Gathering for Justice that says, thank you so much for all of your hard work, heart work and leadership, um, certainly. And then we have a question from Adrian that says, what did you mean when you said the legacy of nuclear testing informs how you approach climate change? I'm a little unclear, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for asking that question because I wanted to elaborate a bit more, but I was trying to get through all those other areas. So with the legacy of nuclear testing, um, you know, because so many nuclear weapons were tested um, in our islands, literally islands were incinerated. And Bikini Atoll to this day can never, it's still unlivable. We can never live there ever again. It's our biggest atoll, one of our most luscious, and yet we can never live there. So basically, when we talk about climate change, when we talk about the impending loss of our islands, we already know how it feels to lose islands. We already know the pain and how it impacts our culture and how it impacts our people. So that really informs how we deal with climate change moving forward. We don't want to have that to happen again and or that to happen to anybody else. So that's one way, um, you know, that that is one way in, in which it informs us. Um, the other way is that, you know, these are forces that are so much larger happening, you know, and, and we're we're the victims in these in these situations. You know, the nuclear testing when it conduct was conducted, the US came to us and said, 
Um, you know, they literally said, we're, do you need we're doing this for the good of mankind, you know, and we made this ultimate sacrifice just so the United States could be able to tell what, you know, how these nuclear weapons affects land, sea, air, and also people, because there was also allegations that came out. Um, if you look up something called Project 4.1, where they actually tested how the radioactive materials, you know, there was radioactive powder that fell on one island where that was actually inhabited by people, you know, they use that to inform what, you know, to, to find, to get more data on how nuclear testing impacts people. So, you know, all that to say we're victims of these like global forces, you know, when we shouldn't have been. And with climate change, Marshall Islands' entire um, uh, contributions towards the world's global emissions is 0. 0.00001 one percent of the world's global emissions and yet we're the first ones to be impacted and to lose our entire nation i mean that really can't be said any other way like we're losing our entire nation and we're at risk of losing our entire country even though we contributed absolutely nothing to um, climate change and the world's global emissions so that's and the second way in which it's informing how we approach climate change and then the third and final one it's a little bit more concrete uh, we're building, like I mentioned earlier, something called the National Adaptation Plan, a really core component of the National Adaptation Plan, which is our plan, our, what we're calling our survival plan, our plan for how we will adjust these islands so that we can stay in it. Um, a core component is something called the community consultations, and that's where we're going to really literally do outreach to several, to all of the different, to as many of the different islands as we can, and to all the different communities, you know, highlighting women, youth, vulnerable populations um, and getting their perspectives on what they want to do moving forward. You know, with this threat coming, what kinds of adaptation pathways do they want to see? We are making sure to prioritize specific nuclear affected atolls and get their perspectives on that national adaptation plan. So that's a really concrete way in which we're incorporating the nuclear legacy into our climate plans. So. That's, I hope that's clear. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you so much for dropping in all of that, that wisdom and, and all of the great work that you're doing. I think it's that plan that you just talked about is definitely um, revolutionary. I mean, there's such a legacy of just completely, um, you know, destroying and having so wrecking so much havoc on our islands, you know, very similar situation in Guahan, um, just the combination of militarism and um, climate change is, is destructing. Um, let's see, we have a comment from Melissa M. Um, it says, Talofa Lava, and thank you, Kathy, for all of your work. A question we have is, is poetry a form of art that is practiced amongst your family? Siblings, relatives, parents, what inspires you to use poetry as a form to express these valid concerns and urgency? Thank you, um, Melissa. So, no, <laughs> not at all. It's very weird. Everybody was weirded out when I was doing it. <laughs> I remember taking my mom to my first spoken word um, competition, and afterwards we walked out and she was like, I don't know what I just watched. I don't know what that was. <laughs> like, <laughs> she had no idea. So um, it's not at all something that's really common out here. And um, none of my siblings or cousins, nobody in my family usually does it or does it as openly as I do it. Um, what inspired me to do it was um, poetry just always kind of really came naturally to me. I really loved reading and I really loved writing. And when I started writing poetry in English class, I started doing it for myself just as much, just to sort of help me understand the world around me. And then um, I, uh, a slam poetry workshop came to my school and it just clicked for some reason. I love the idea of performance and poetry together. And um, I you know, joined the group that was representing Hawaii at the national poetry competition. I, I was able to make it, which is really cool. Um, and then I participated in college in a, in a poetry program called Poetry for the People at UC Berkeley. Um, and out there, that's where I um, learned that poetry could be a tool for revolution. You know, I started reading Black poets, um, Chicano poets, uh, Arab poets who were all speaking to the issues that their communities were facing. And so I started thinking, What's our issues? You know, what, what what am I what am I facing? And so that's when I started using 
um, performance poetry to highlight, you know, different issues that I saw as problematic. And so first it was nuclear testing. Then it was a poem video on um, the racism that Micronesians have experienced in Hawaii. And then it became climate change. And from there, I was selected to speak on at the United Nations Climate Summit. And I, they were like, we see you using poetry. Can you write a poem for it? And then from there, you know, I started performing a lot on climate change. And that's how I became Climate Envoy. So it's actually really interesting, you know, how I would never have planned for it to my career path way to go this way. But, you know, I think poetry matters when we make it matter, basically. Yeah. And we are so glad that your career path ended up going this way. <laughs> um, thank you, Em, for that question. Next, we have a question from the Gathering for Justice. How can folks who are here get involved or show up? Great question. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of, so I always encourage people to explore what current climate groups there are in their own area, um, because a, a lot of times there's people who've been doing the work for you know years, and I would encourage collaborating or supporting those organizations in some form. But I also know, you know, as a caveat, you know, as someone who's been in those spaces that sometimes it can be very, um, well, to be uh, like white dominated spaces for, you know, so for people of color, for Islanders in particular, it can be really difficult to be in those spaces and be, you become tokenized. I, I've experienced that firsthand multiple times. So you do have to be careful about, um, you know, where you go into those spaces but if you can't, then it would be about, you know, creating those kinds of groups yourself and, you know, um, and, uh, and finding ways to collaborate with existing organizations, incorporating climate change into your existing work, uh, and, and then um, highlighting those who are really the most vulnerable in your communities to, to, that, to that issue. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Um, now we have a question from Musiate, who says, can there be actual material change in regards to climate change under global capitalism? It seems this socioeconomic system requires exploitation and consuming of land people and oil to maintain itself. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, <laughs> dismantling global capitalism is, is, is just as hard as, as, as addressing climate change. You know, it's all one and the same. And I, to be completely transparent, I'm not as, you know, I'm not somebody who has that background in um, capitalism or these kinds of structures. And even though I know that it, it contributes it, I don't know exactly how to explain it or how to dismantle it or what's the best pathway to do that. I, my work tends to focus on just making sure that we highlight the Marshall Islands voice specifically in all of these spaces and highlight the unique issues that, that we're coming to deal with. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure. Um, I, think it, I think it does have to be addressed, but I just don't know how, yeah. Very real question. But I totally agree, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much, Kathy. We also have a private uh, message question, which is um, they would like to hear about the current narratives of NASA scientists in the news and how Pacific Islanders and indigenous communities are addressing climate change. They said the NASA scientists? Yes. Uh, I'm not familiar with what the current NASA scientists they're referencing exactly. But what was the other part of the question? Uh, let's see, the current narrative of the NASA scientists in the news and how Pacific Islanders and indigenous communities are addressing climate change. How, oh, oh, right. Okay, the demonstration. Yeah, I have to admit, I ha I'm not always following all the news in the US con um, about what's happening out there. So I think they demonstrated and chained themselves through a door. Yeah, I mean, I support it. I've, you know, it's funny because I've talked to a lot of climate scientists and, um, you know, there was one with us in Greenland who was taking us around. There was a climate scientist who came and told us we needed to adapt. And what always strikes me is how much emotional, how emotional it is just as much for them as it is for those of us who are on the front lines, like, you know, and how much work it is and how incredibly difficult it is. So when I see what them doing that, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm of course supportive of it. Um, I think activism plays such an important role as someone who's been in the activist space and sort of transitioning back and forth 
between those roles. Um, I think I'm, I'm really glad that they did it. I'm glad that they, you know, brought some media attention to it. I don't think the media attention is enough and it, they don't take it necessarily as seriously as they could, you know, but um, wait, and you said, what was the second part of the? Let me see, it was, um... I think you answered it. It was how um, PIs and indigenous communities are addressing climate change. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's you know I think P, I think the thing that I love the most about the PI community, the Pacific Islander community, and if if you're following the regional Pacific politics, um, you know Pacific Island nations have been really good about leading on the front, you know, internationally on climate change. You know, we have a lot of leaders who have been really vocal about it. Um, you know, the Kiribati, former Kiribati president, Ono Tsong, um, my own mother has always tried to use her platform um, when she was talking about climate change as, as president. Um, and then also, um, you know, our former climate ambassador and minister of, in, of, of uh, foreign affairs, Tony de Bruyne, was who grandfathered the Paris Treaty. We have these giants, these elders who've done the work out there in, in the international space. And then there's also, of course, you know, on the ground, you know, we're using there's some really innovative technologies that we're 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 um, we're coming up with that's based on indigenous knowledge, and we're using those as solutions to climate change impacts as well. So, I think there's a um, 350.org has a chapter called 350 Pacific, and we have the slogan, you know, we are not drowning, we are fighting, and I think that's always trying to put out the message that Pacific Islanders aren't just sitting around, you know, waiting or for handouts, you know, we're, we're fighting just as hard as we can. And there's a lot of solutions and innovative solutions that exist here in our own people, amongst our own people as well. So I would definitely encourage folks, you know, if you're a Pacific Islander to really start following that Pacific regional news, because there's a lot of really interesting things happening in the space, in that space, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we see that Paula dropped in the chat um, a link to the org that you mentioned. And yeah, I mean, all of the things you bring up are just so important for more people to know. Um, and I, I feel so fortunate that we have um, some faculty here on campus at CSM, um, Professor Moon, Professor Iyengar, who are teaching their students about these things. Um, oh. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible, um, you know, learning about the bombing, the atomic bombing that you mentioned already. Um, I just, you know, given the positionality of this conference as um, being, you know, towards and, um, you know, for um, students and for faculty members and, and staff and administrators in higher education, do you have any um, suggestions, any advice for, um, for professors who want to um, make sure that they're, who want to teach things about this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of um, videos and documentaries, like recent ones, um, that feature our Pacific Islander leaders, and I would definitely encourage them to be using those. Um, and then uh, advice on, well, usually you, you might have Pacific Islander students in your classes who might have access to, you know, information, maybe they have family members back home doing that work who could also speak to those um, experiences as well. And I would definitely dip into that kind of well of knowledge. Though I know that um, I have a lot of family members who've been in those classes, who've been put on the spot, who feel really uncomfortable too, because they're like, I can't speak on this. I can't, you know, be the one to represent. But I, you know, my, I always try to encourage and, and remind other young Romano, other young Pacific Islanders that their stories really matter. And just, just knowing, you know, just being able to speak on on your feelings on on that loss is really important too. So um, yeah, but as far as like other recommendations, um, there's a lot of really good scholarly work out there on Pacific Island issues and and climate change. So I, I would also encourage the use of those uh, articles and work. But I can't think of them off the top of my head right now because I, I see in the Q and A are there any book recommendations on this topic you you recommend? Um, and I'm trying to figure out like anything that I've read recently, because literally all I read now is like policy documents. You know, the United States just came out with their defensive, the, the, the defensive department, the defense department just came out with their own climate change strategy. And I think that that's going to impact 
the Pacific Island nations that are territories like the, you know, American Samoa, Guahan, um, you know, um, uh, CNMI. So I think, you know, keeping a watch for that because they're going to be using, they're recognizing the, the fact that the DOD recognizes climate change is the biggest issue as a huge issue is a big deal. And it'll likely impact the way that they um, adjust and, and, try to and try to support islands that are states and territories um, of the US. So I think watching that could be really interesting. And then the Marshall Islands, the compact, the, the Marshall Islands, Palau, and also the Federated States of Micronesia is headed into compact negotiations with the United States and we're renewing our treaty with the US. So, you know, we're in a really critical state right now because all of all, a lot of a huge chunk of our funding comes from the United States. It'll be really important to watch that as well, especially as countries like the Solomon Islands starts paying attention to has, you know, negotiated a new security deal with China. As China increases its presence, the U.S. is increasing their their presence in the Pacific, and so we're once again getting drawn into these like global battles. And I think paying attention to what's happening in the Pacific right now to our own islands is really critical. Wow, the intersectional lens that you bring to this space, combining the arts, um, climate change, indigenous rights, and also policy and globalization and capitalism, it's its just so incredible. Um, and I'm, I'm really thankful to be able to learn from you. Um, it is 414, so are there are there any um, final comments or, or, you know, bits of wisdom that you would love to share with us? Oh, oh, uh, I got nothing. But thank you so much for having me in your space. Um, Jojigum has a PayPal account on our website. If you'd be willing to donate, we take donations. Um, we're a small nonprofit that relies on grants and donations. So we, um, I'm calling you from our youth center right now. Our like youth workers are here all on their headphones. So they don't <laughs> trying to stay quiet while I'm on this keynote. So um, yeah, so if you'd love to, if you'd like to support our work out here and the youth who are working out here, they're the ones that are, um, you know, uh, they're the ones that are, you know, really pushing our, keeping our organization going and they're the ones that would benefit from those donations the most. So please feel free to, to please support um, our work. We'd really appreciate it. Malo Apito, Kathy, um, for coming here, for, for sharing all the work that you do and all of these issues that are so incredibly important and that truly affect us all. You know, it, it may be affecting the Marshall Islands now, it may be affecting um, the rest of the Pacific Islands in a few years, but it, this will ultimately affect the whole world. You know, this is, it's one, yeah. one water, one body of water around this entire planet. But I really, really thank you so much for coming. Um, and yes, please, everybody continue to, after this session, look up Kathy, read more of her work, look up her youth organization, and please donate and support. Um, it is incredibly, incredibly important, the work that they are doing. And there's some love in the chat. Um, yes, thank you so, so much, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right, wonderful. So everyone can hop off now and we will be um, taking a 15 minute break and then hopping into our session two with Sogorea Te Lentrest. Thank hey, thanks Leila, I'm gonna log off. Sounds Bye. good, thank you so much, Kathy. Okay. Hi there, this is Rebecca speaking. Do you mind um, spelling the name of the next presenter, please? Yes. Um, or typing it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for your patience. And um, yeah, bearing with us as we take a little break, bio break, means break, food, and all of that. Um, we have our lovely guests joining us now. Um, and I'll pass it over to my co-lead, Brittany, um, to facilitate this session. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Leila. Hi, everyone, and welcome to session two of day one, Climate Justice and Indig Indigenous Resistance. I'm so honored to welcome our second speakers of the day, so the Sogoreate Land Trust, which is an urban indigenous women-led land trust based in the San Francisco Bay Area that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indigenous people. Through the practices of rematriation, cultural re vitalization and land restoration, Sogoreate calls on native and non-native peoples to heal and transform the legacies of colonization, genocide and patriarchy and to do the work our ancestors and future generations are calling us to do. They envision a Bay area in which Ohlone language and ceremony are an active thriving part of the cultural landscape where Ohlone place names and history is known and recognized and where intertribal indigenous communities have affordable housing, social services, cultural centers, and land to live, work, and prey on. So now I'm honored to be passing it over to them. Thank you so much for joining us. What's up? Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Paula. Thank you to everyone that organized the space and is here engaging. My name is Ines Izquierda. I am a mestiza. Uh, artist and educator. I'm a queer disabled writer, organizer, activist, and I'm honored to work um, with Sogorate Land Trust here in Oakland, also known as the territory of Fuchin. And I'm coming to visiting you today from, um, this is a traditional homeland of Lashon Ohlone people. And all of us um, grew up on someone's traditional homeland. Maybe very few of us here on our own homelands but all of us were guests on someone's land, right? So um, I want us all to kind of think about that when we were children, whose land did we grow up on? Uh, if you know, you can type it in the chat. Actually, this is a webinar, I don't know. If, is it possible to see people talking? Can you guys see me? I saw a comment that said that, was it just audio? So that's why I was Um, I wanted to share a, there we go. Can you guys see me now? Awesome. Okay, so now I'm on spotlighted. Um, I wanted to share a short video that I made. Uh, it's called The Land You're On, and it has the voices of Karina Gould, the founder of Sogorte Land Trust, who was supposed to be here tonight. And she is actually at a memorial service. So um, I'm stepping in for her. Uh, one of our community members had passed, and so they're gathering to honor, honor that passing. And um, I have a video and it has Karina's voice in it. And she's talking a little bit about the history of the land. It has her daughter Stasia's voice in it. And because we always want to allow people to represent themselves and uplift their voices, um, I wanted to share this short video. So I'm gonna pop this on right now and it has a number of questions in it. Uh, so if you have any thoughts about these questions, if any responses come to you as you're watching it, um, just write those down or note them maybe for sharing in this space later. So right now, can everyone see my screen? I'm gonna play and see if you guys can hear. Where are you? Do you guys hear that? I can't see anyone, so I think. Yes, we could hear that. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> Stop. Where are you? Stop, just be there, put your feet on the ground, feel it stretching below you, arrive here. So if you can imagine 200 years ago, there was an abundance in our territory that there was not even a concept of hunger or homelessness. For thousands of years, we lived like that until the minute came.
people think that we don't exist anymore. Our people have always been here in the East Bay, enslaved at both Mission Dolores in San Francisco and Mission San Jose in Fremont. Our people have always been here, in 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 here. In here, 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 in here. Our people have always been here, and we are part of what many people think of as Ohlone. Ohlone is a generic term that we are trying to get away from as we ourselves decolonize. There are eight tribal nation territories with just as many languages and creation stories. It's important for people to understand that we had gone through three different colonizations in a very short period of time. And after that happened, the state of California was created by making uh, laws that made it illegal to be Indian. And so it was about the extermination of my people as well as other native people. We have been erased from history in the Bay Area and through history books. Indigenous people are still here. When the invaders came, one of the first things they did was try and destroy our amaranth. They could see that our food is our medicine, is our spirit, and they thought they would be able to destroy us by making amaranth illegal. They burned our fields, they cut off the hands of people that tried to grow or harvest amaranth. They did the worst things. But somehow our ancestors knew that we would need the seeds and they sewed them into their clothing and they braided them into their hair and they smuggled them through all the places that they were forced to go and they saved them generation after generation after generation. And somehow some of those seeds made it to us. And this year we grew amaranth on rematriated indigenous land in deep east Oakland. Each seed is like this tiny piece of hope that our ancestors had that we would make it. Each seed is last, and each seed is the future. What did your ancestors pass on to you? What seeds are you saving? What will you pass on? Every week we get phone calls and emails about ancestors being found as developments are being put in. Our shell mounds once ringed the entire Bay Area and there was 425 of them. And we began to do work around saving these sites in 1999. Our sacred sites in the Bay Area um, are continuously being uh, uh, attacked you know, last week I was called into Alameda because there is a big development happening 
And they're thinking that they might be, try to remove 50 to 100 of our ancestors. So this is an ongoing process, a continual genocide and disrespect of our cemeteries. To rematriate is to restore a sacred relationship between place and people. There needed to be places for indigenous people to reconnect. And we began to talk about this idea of using a land trust as a way of bringing land back into indigenous hands, sovereign pieces of land where we could do our languages and our ceremonies and we can grow food and medicine, a place where native people could just be native people. If you go past the railroad tracks and past the liquor store, all the way down 105th, deep, deep East Oakland, that's where Lashawn is, unceded and the first land returned to indigenous stewardship in the territory. know that it is essential in this time for the next seven generations that we stand together. Decolonization is not a metaphor. Decolonization is about the return of indigenous land and life ways. And everyone has something they can contribute to that. Because right now, wherever you are, you're on indigenous land. Thank you guys for watching that. Um, thank you so much. Um, that was only nine minutes, but it had a huge amount of our of our history and information in it and, and from a variety of approaches. And so I wanted to share a little bit more with you. I know that this, um, this section is around indigenous people and the environment and all over the world, indigenous people are huge protectors of the environment, but we're also talking about not just like the natural world, but the environments that we live in, right? All environments, the city is an environment, an indigenous environment um, also, right? So when we're talking about that, not to just think about, um, you know, reservations and woods and mountains, but Oakland and San Francisco are also indigenous land, um, as you already know. So the first thing, if you guys can see this, let me try and go to full screen here. And this has, um, you know, some of the information that 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 was in the slideshow uh, or in that movie clip. But I'll just skip through anything that's a little bit repetitive. We started with the land that we were on. You might have seen this this map um, when we were in the film. And so this is one map that has um, the different territory names in their own languages. And one of the things about maps is they never have everyone's own names for themselves in their own languages. They're always just a form of documentation of one part, right? No map is complete. Um, and so what I wanna talk about to start is a very brief history of California 
And what Karina talks about is that there's kind of, there was three waves of colonization. The first one was the mission system. Um, when the missions came in and they, they enslaved native people, it was what Karina calls the first prison industrial complex. Um, and this is the Catholic church really built a huge amount of wealth on this stolen land. And many of these missions still stand right now and lasted for about a hundred years. The next wave of colonization was the Spanish Rancheria system. And, um, and this is where property, where land became property. The crown claimed a lot of the East Bay under the Peralta land grant. And then they just started selling it and giving it away to other people. And it was officially documented on a piece of paper. And this is one of those first pieces of paper that said the land owned. Um, and this time, most native people in California became kind of de facto slaves in the Rancheria system, working in mines, working as indentured labor. Um, not a lot of rights, not a lot of resources. And then the third wave of colonization is, is considered the United States. And what's really different about this wave is um, now the, the main policy was mass extermination. No longer did the ruling government want to exploit the labor of native people. They just wanted the land. And so this is a picture of the gold rush that brought a lot of settlers into California um, when it was first becoming a state in 1850. And um, during that time, um, 30,000 indigenous, uh, many, many, many indigenous people were murdered. And the state actually would, would give money for people to prove that they had killed native people. And it was said that if you couldn't find gold, you could probably find a native person to try and get the bounty for their life. So when we talk about that we live on land that's founded on genocide, we mean it's, our state is literally founded on a law that was trying to destroy native people. So now we're um, jumping up to 1920s. And again, this is a very brief history. And this is a picture of the Emeryville Shell Mound. And so the whole Bay Area was full of shell mounds um, back in the day, because they were the burial sites of the people whose land this is. And in the 20s and 30s, um, as development started happening throughout the Bay, they started taking these shell mounds and filling in the Bay. So a lot of the bay was muddy marshland. They filled it in, they filled in the roads and they added more and more land by destroying these burial grounds. They turned them into fertilizer and sold them all over the country. And the bodies of the ancestors are literally lining our streets. Um, this is a picture of the um, Golden Gate Bridge going in. And, and the reason that I show this is just to remind us that any kind of historical thing that we're thinking about, you know, I always try to remind myself where we're the people whose land we were on while this was happening. And in the 30s, the Ohlone people were, were mostly in hiding outside of the Rancheria system. A lot of folks would pretend they were Mexican or of Spanish descent to try and um, avoid some of the racism and discrimination. Um, it was still pretty much illegal to be native. In the 50s and 60s, um, the US started a policy of assimilation. They dissolved reservations and sent native folks to cities. So this is a picture of Indian girls leaving for LA. And um, LA and Oakland actually have the highest populations of native people in the whole country because of these policies that sent native folks away from their homelands. And the idea was, you know, they're gonna give them jobs and things like that, but a lot of times that didn't actually happen. Um, one thing that did happen was people started organizing with each other. Indians from all over the place were now in cities together and they started doing, um, this is a picture from Alcatraz where Indians of all nations took over the island. They had an education center there and this was part of intertribal organizing that was happening in the 70s. Going really fast here, gonna jump forward a couple decades to the 90s and I'm doing this to orient us into where we are. Right, so in this whole Bay Area, we know there was hell of development around the dot-com boom, Silicon Valley, and that was in the 90s. And when that happened, massive development, buildings, 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 condos going up everywhere. And, you know, there, the, there hadn't been since the last wave of development that kind of digging. And they started digging up ancestors and cultural sites and shell mounds and burials that are taking out these buildings. And this time, there was some, some laws, NAGPRA, that could protect and um, kind of offer people who are still living from those tribes some kind of say in what happens to those ancestral bodies and cultural artifacts. And so Karina Gould and Janella LaRose started organizing to try, when as they were destroying these sites, the shamans, they started organizing to walk every site in the Bay Area, 425 of them. 
um, to bring awareness back of that. Uh, Ohlone people are still here, Native people are still here, and these are our burials. And so they did that for many, many years, people from all over the world. This picture shows um, some Buddhist monks that came from Japan to walk with them. And, um, you know, this would take weeks and weeks and weeks. They were both single moms and they would pray and walk and pray and walk every day. In 2011, one of the sacred sites um, in, in Glen Cove, Vallejo, was under imminent threat. The site was also known as Sogorate, which is where we get our name from. And so Gorete has was a very special place um, for the Ohlone for a lot of reasons. And one of them was, was this was, Karina says this was the last place that her people were free before the missions, one of the last holdouts. So Gorete, it's right on the Carquina Strait. And um, they decided that they weren't going to let it get developed. So they took over for 109 days. They invited people from all over the world and they led a sacred prayer to protect that site. And many things came out of that action. Um, this place ended up going into a cultural easement with the city, with a different tribe. It was not developed, it was saved. Um, and one of the things that came out of this action was the idea that needed another way to access land collectively for indigenous people. The reason that agreement went to another tribe is because Karina's tribe is not federally recognized. Um, so she doesn't have any land rights. Uh, so that's when Karina Janela started organizing the land trust. So here's some of our planning docs here with the littlest Ohlone Omne there um, crawling through. And, and what's kind of different about this work is it's, it's indigenous women led. And we call that rematriation, restoring people to their rightful place in sacred relationship with their ancestral land. Um, it's kind of a play on repatriation, right? But um, matriarchal. <laughs> This is a picture of Standing Rock in 2006, and we're connected to you know, indigenous struggles to protect land and water all over the world. Those are also protecting the sacred. Um, land and water are sacred, water is life. And um, what happened after Standing Rock, many people from the Bay went up there, um, they were defending the land up there from the uh, oil pipeline, and some folks from the Bay area, while they were there, talked to the elders, and they kind of said, you know, we want to we want to keep doing this work. We we feel this very deeply. And they had told them, go back to where you're from, work with the native people there. So they did. They came back, and they found Karina and Janella. This was um, Gavin and Hale from Planting Justice, a food justice and prison reentry program um, here in Oakland. And they said, we want to. We have this nursery, and we want to open this land and return it to you. And um, this is it right here. This is the little area on 105th Avenue, uh, the first land that came back. And along the side here is the uh, old drainage thing that's all cemented. But it used to be the Lashon Creek, which is um, one of the ancestral creeks of Karina's people. And it's really interesting because towns and villages were always kind of located where the creek was starting to come into the bay. So this would be maybe a place her ancestors lived in the past. Um, and when we got access to this land, they decided the first thing that they wanted to do was build an arbor, a ceremonial arbor to bring back the songs and dances that have been laying dormant for more than 250 years. So we started building it. Um, I'm going to jump through some of these a little bit more. These are just some processes of building the arbors. It was very cool. We did almost everything by hand. We prayed for every tree that was fallen. We um, cut all the bark off with machetes over a year's period of time. We had many, many work days where people came out and helped us. This is one where a group had made all these shovels out of um, guns that had been melted down. And they gave them to us as a like, composting violence to bring them to the land and have them be a part of growing justice. So it was kind of a cool project. Um, here's some other pictures of the raising of the ceremonial arbor. You can see this was the women's pole. And each poll kind of was designated for someone in our community. There was an elder's poll. There was a two-spirit people's poll. Here's LaShawn, the site. We have um, a group visiting here. Here we are with some Aboriginal dancers, and we're all um, putting up our kukiai mauna for Mauna Kea, for the mountain, in solidarity with our um, Kanaka relatives. Here's one of our emergency response hubs, Hemetka. This is in East Oakland. And, what we've been trying to do is add um, water, solar, kind of all the things we'd need to, to make it. Um, and we have, you know, where we're getting these little tiny pieces of land, 
that's other parts of the city, like Deep East Oakland, West Oakland, you know, there's not a lot of services or resources out there. So it's essential for our communities that we are starting to make these sustainable hubs. We're growing plant medicines and learning how to make herbal remedies, bringing back some of the native pollinators. We have some mugwort and poppies here, a little peak of the garden, um, cultural activities, relieving some tuli, gathering. These are some Chochenyo language signs. Um, bringing back language practice is one of the, the tribal projects. A food distribution program, something that we started during COVID, became clear that elders in the city didn't have access to fresh food. Uh, here's another garden um, in West Oakland. And this one, um, it's been really interesting how these ideas have been spreading and how people ally with us. And, and there's something about the justice of returning land to indigenous women that, that is, um, it resonates with some people. And we're finding some allies that are, that are really supporting us. And here's from one letter from a, a couple that left. They wrote Sigourte into their will, you know, and they had reached out to us before and they had been thinking about it for a while. And, and one of the things they wrote is, you know, we're choosing not to perpetuate the unearned privilege of passing our homes within our white families. And also struck by this, this note, like their, their whole process that at the end of their lives, they had come to this idea that, that there was one really big thing that there was kind of a, in their life that they didn't feel resolved about, which was passing on this stolen land. And so um, this is just one example of a very tangible way that people are shifting resources. If, a, if that house, for example, to one of our native single moms with kids, like that starts to transform some of that legacy where she might be able to go to college without debt. Her kids might be able to grow up in a house that they own. It's, it starts to be that shift, right? So it's not just about the resource being passed on, but it's about um, all the supports that that enables. And that one of the way that we're doing this work is through this thing called Shaomi Land Tax. And this is a voluntary way that people can support our work while recognizing, you know, there, there was a financial benefit to colonization. There's a benefit to being on stolen land. And um, if we receive that benefit, what can we do to give back this very small voluntary tax? And um, we have like a little calculator on our website you can go on there and be like, I'm a renter, I own, and it will give you a suggestion like, hey, throw this down to the land trust every year. Um, and the reason we use the word tax is just to kind of evoke that thing that like we can all contribute to this. Like this is a world we might want where indigenous people have access to some of their land back and we can all throw down for it. Um, so I encourage you guys to check that out. I encourage you to go to shellman.org. This is your local sacred site. It's an imminent threat. Looks like a parking lot at 4th, 4th Street in Berkeley, but um, it's the last open place where there was a shell mound that hasn't been dug up, that hasn't had a condo put in it. And it was um, one of the biggest shell mounds in the Bay Area. It's still there and, and they're fighting like how to save it. So tap in shellmound.org. Um, other things that you can do, um, quick list here and I can send this out, but just learn more about where you are. If anything in this share today struck you, talk to someone else about it. If you know someone in your family that has more than they need, encourage them to give some of it away. Um, just hook in, you know, follow that accounts on social media. And if there's a call to action, you know, pass it on or show up, um, organize, talk to people, grow your own food, be a guest. Um, so for now, I think that that will be my share. I'm gonna leave some time for questions. And um, thank you guys so much. I would also love to hear what your uh, multicultural center is working or focused on and different ways that you guys might be supporting indigenous work at your school and in your towns. Thank you so much for that, Ines, and for talking a little bit about the work of Sagoreate Land Trust, um, you know, and sharing all the important and necessary work you are all doing, and of course, allowing, allowing us to reflect on exactly whose land we're on. Um, we will now be opening up the floor um, for a Q&A session. Um, just a reminder, please direct all questions to the Q&A function on Zoom, and if you have any comments or reactions, feel free to use the chat box. 
Um, are there any questions that we have for Ines? Your folks have talked on minutes and um, you all if you have any questions too we feel free to I guess I have a question um so in the last session we had a Marshallese um poet um political um figure um Kathy Jetmel Kitchener, and she was speaking about um, the the role of poetry and the arts in her um, her liberation work and and in her fight against all of these systems of oppression. Um, how has the arts, um, whether it be poetry, visual art, I mean, I I already saw lots of paintings and um, dances and and things like that. Um, but yeah, is there like a certain memorable? Um, time that you can think of that the arts really played a significant role in your work? I like that question. Hmm. For me, what comes to mind, the first thing just for me personally is um, the role of like documentation, community documentation, photo, video, and I'm, I'm thinking of pictures I've seen of um, Native folks in Oakland in 1920. Native folks in Oakland in 1950. Um, you know, just people of different of different backgrounds coming through. So when I see documentations like that, I I love that. That's one of the first things that comes to mind. Murals. We are blessed to live in a city with so many beautiful murals, and Sugarte has been collaborating on murals and and visual collective ways to kind of like tell a story publicly. I love that. I think amazing. Um, those are some of the first things that come to mind in terms of the ways that arts have been supportive. I know for um, the tribal members, the cultural arts practices around weaving and basketry, those comes with practices around harvesting, those come with songs, those come with all sorts of, they're like a, you know, a cosmovision of relation with, with plants and practices. So I think it's very expansive. Thank you for the comments folks through into the chat. Um, what kinds of things is your um, is your multicultural center? Is there any initiatives to spring for supporting indigenous uh, folks on campus? I saw recently you guys saw the um, UC system that they're going to let all um, tribally enrolled folks go for free. That was like, I'll show you that. Yeah, there was a cool announcement from the UC system. If you're enrolled in a tribe, of course, that doesn't benefit people that are not, but it's a good first step. I don't want to take up too much of the mic. Um, so please, Brittany, if you have any questions or if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A or, or um, click the raise your hand function. Um, but I guess just answering, oh, um, Brittany, I'll, I'll pass it. I'll, I'll answer your question later if there is um, space, but I'll pass it to you, Brittany, um, to read out one of the questions in the chat. Thanks, Leila. Yeah, so one question we received, Catherine asks, what can we do to bring awareness to the current assault on indigenous land, and more specifically in our classrooms? Mm. Um, well, I think that folks, the more that you know, the more that anyone you can bring in to conversations, to talk. So I think like educating yourself, connecting with people is always a great way to do that. Um, also bring awareness, not just to the, like similarly, not just the assault, but also like who's kind of benefiting from that? What are the businesses? Wait, is our school involved in that business? Like chasing some of those monies, I think is really important. Um, recently found like an art project that I was invited to was like mainly funded by Wells Fargo who also funds um, Line 3, which is one of the most destructive oil lines and um, that native people are, are trying to fight, right? So I was like, I'm not gonna do a, that art project's not honoring, right? So it's, it's been really interesting. I think those are some things to bring awareness. Um, I know that people like say, have different opinions about social media, but you guys always, you know, uplift, like, share native creators, read native authors, watch movies by native people, take native teachers. I could go on. <laughs> Listen native music. <laughs> 
There's lots of good things to do, yeah. Let's see, at the University of California, I guess that's the, um, that's a little, you know, if anyone here from university, please note. <laughs> um, there's lots of great, there's lots of great Native authors. I just got gifted this one, Postcolonial Love Poems by Nadiali Diaz that I'm interested in reading. Let's see, so yeah, thank you guys for um, the questions and thoughts. Um, some of the, Right now we had just gotten, so Goethe just got our first house. Um, so we're kind of um, trying to figure out what does it mean to do housing? We are really focused on land and food and cultural things. And, and it becomes really obvious, you know, like it's hard for native people to stay in the Bay Area. It's very expensive here. And, um, you know, with, with access to the first house comes kind of like, you know, what, what kind of world would we build if people didn't have to pay rent? You know, so we're, we're, we're getting to kind of dream a little bit to imagine, you know, if this land comes in indigenous hands and it's liberated, then there's not the same costs as house that's on market for profit. Like then people can live for less money here. And, and it's really exciting to be going in this uh, direction. Awesome. Well, let's see if there's no, oh, someone put it into the chat. Thank you, Paula. Oh, I see the questions is in a different section. Yeah, we have another question from Gathering for Justice and they ask, um, they commented, love the Shumi land tax. Is this something you all believe should be spread across? Wondering how, if this is something that should be implemented with native tribes in our communities. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, I We have shared this with this model with many people. The Shumi land tax was in by the We Are Honor Tax. We are up in Northern California and they had this kind of model first and we had approached them and said, hey, can we use something like this? And now we have consulted with other tribes and allies that are doing similar things. I know there's Real Rent up in Seattle. Um, which other ones are there? There's several, there's one in Albuquerque. Oh, there's the Manhattan Fund in New York City. You'll notice a lot of these are cities, right? Um, cities that don't have uh, federally recognized tribes. The tribes have no land bases. And so, yes, we have on our website tools for how allies can help support these. We have guidelines around land taxes. Um, I think that there's, yeah, there's different ways to do it. And it's interesting because um, it's like direct support, you know, it's kind of outside of a grant system. Um, and it, it's, it's not just charity, it's recognizing a responsibility as well. So I think, yeah, I think it should spread. I think there's a lot in this world and it could be spread around a lot more. <laughs> no open questions. Can awesome. I oh, I see someone um, dropped the Rumatish tax in the, or in there. That's awesome. Rumatish in San Francisco, Yalamu, if you guys are in that territory, if you know people that are, for sure, pass that one on. Yeah, thank you so much, Paula, for um, for uplifting that. I believe we we mentioned this earlier in our land acknowledgement. Um, I want to say it's the the Yanakin land tax. It, it's um, their word for for village, I believe. Um, but yeah, as College of San Mateo is located on the Ramatush's um, land, so super important to highlight. But I, um, Inez, I love. Um, what you were talking about on the um, the wordplay and the the flipping of repatriation to rematriation, uh, like as as someone who is just really into linguistics and like poetry, um, just particularly appreciate that. But I am curious, um, just could you could you speak more um, about the importance and like the role that um, this work plays from a, like from it being from a feminist. Um, you know, like a woman-led perspective? Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think that one thing that I hear our leaders talk about a lot is that there's, there's like a similarity between the way that earth is treated and the way that women are treated, right? That, that people think about that in this way of, um, I don't know, there's a patriarchal violence, right? In the approach to, to environmental destruction to our treatment of the earth under capitalism. And there's a patriarchy in how women have been treated and our bodies have been treated much the same ways. Uh, so this work is necessarily anti-patriarchal. Um, I think that it's important that it's women-led 
uh, because women have been a lot of land work women have been the targets of genocide as producers of life. And um, even now, you know, when this land trust was starting in Karina, Janelle were trying to like learn more about it, you know, they were go to these land trusts and environmental conventions and conservation land things of all white men, <laughs> you know, like it was very much male run. And so um, I think that part of it for me, it's such a gift to be able to, to be under the leadership of a matriarchy and to see how that's different. What does it mean if every space would invite someone to have a baby on their hip? Right, you got to organize yourselves differently if people are going to roll in with babies. Like you have to have everything, but that's an access practice, right? Your whole everything you do different is going to be different if elders can be there and young people and people with different abilities. Like you're going to make a richer and deeper movement and and world. So um, I think that's a little off from your question, but yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely feminist work, and and I think that that in the face of this wild patriarchal capitalist world to just be under the leadership of women is like really revolutionary. We have an audio question in the conference room. What does that mean? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming in this. We have historically seen uh, ways in which indigenous and native people have uh, tried successfully, and sometimes not so. Uh, gained land back in California from the Alcatraz occupation to uh, those wonderful uh, album showcases of community empowerment and power uh, to get land back. Uh, what do you see? How do you see this happening in states outside of California? Uh, okay, I that it was had a little trouble understanding, but what I heard of the question was um, kind of like how, what land back is happening other places? Is that the essence of the question? Yeah. Um, you guys, it's so exciting right now, the land back that's happening. We try and follow it and there's really exciting things happen. There's individuals, there's just families, but there's also groups like in Maine, there's all these different organizations, land trusts, environmentalists, um, housing orgs, they all got together and they decided through the whole state we're going to make our priority supporting indigenous land acquisition. And since they decided that they've gotten this tribe and like they've been returning land because they're multi organizational across the whole state. So I've heard of all over many, many states land backs happening institutions and schools that are closing down are returning their buildings to places, churches, especially churches and um, a lot, not the Catholic church, but other churches like um, I've heard of Episcopalian and Unitarian Protestant churches closing and giving the land and to the tribe whose land that they're on. So I think that's really exciting people in a faith communities that are kind of reflecting on the history of, of their kind of foundings are, are doing things to heal those histories. And it's really exciting. Um, I think there's some laws too. California just dedicated some money to putting land back into tribal hands. Um, and I've heard of some other states doing that too. Thanks for the question. Awesome. There is a hand raised in Paula. I see the hand. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Ligia Andrade Zuniga. Um, I am a school board member for the high school district in uh, San Mateo on Ramay Tushaloni land. And my question is with the necessary, necessary um, need for affordable housing in this area, and especially because we're losing a lot of our teachers and our um, administrators and just, just people that work in our schools with our young people. How can we bridge the gaps between developers and our community to make sure that people are true to um, respecting, you know, the, the lands that were here and, um, you know, our people that are here, um, but also, you know, creating these housing developments, it's really tough. Because I, you know, I I see the struggle between like keeping 
keeping in mind, you know, what, you know, what our history is, but then also the fight, you know, between what these land developers are really about. Do you know what I'm saying? So I don't know how, like, what, what in your opinion, what would be the best way to bring, bridge these gaps and stay true to our communities? Mm. Man, I wish I had all these answers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I truly don't know the answer, but I would say, I don't think, I don't know exactly what the gap is because indigenous people are also your community, right? We're teachers. Yeah we're construction workers. We also need affordable housing in the Bay Area. Like it's not separate. So um, I think that part of that is like a setup from developers, right? It, it works much better for them if we are um, in conflict with each other, but really we need to have some land that's out of the um, speculative real estate market. We need to have mm -hmm. land that's out of profit. And there's plenty, there's plenty of land and resources that's just being um, hoarded, right? There, there's, um, I think that there's enough for all of us and that if we had uh, systems that prioritize housing over profit for some people, we would be able to kind of address all those indigenous people's housing, teachers' housing, artists, um, you know, folks with different abilities that can't work, everyone, right? We all need housing. So um, that's one of the yeah. first that comes to mind. And I, I do appreciate that question though, because I've heard it a lot. You might know with the West Berkeley Shell Mound um, that they're trying to put in housing there, right? And yeah. so they specifically target, well, um, mixed use retail and uh -huh. you know, very expensive high rise housing. But um, that has been part of the, the thing of how could this, how could they want to say this is we need housing so bad. And, you know, there's, there's lots of other there's lots of other factors that are involved in this that have nothing to do with either of those, either or binary. So um, my wish is that that we all get what we need, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I really appreciate your answer. Um, it's just, it's, it's hard when there's a struggle between, right, capitalism and like trying to stay true to our communities and make sure that we're getting what we need without like, you know, only 20% will be given to affordable housing which is like 20 percent you know depending on how many units they have might be like eight you know and it's like that's not equitable and like it's been you know with a really clear like even those low income housing are like eighty thousand dollar income right housing. we're like uh what and um yeah it's fascinating it's fascinating how also very clear that the developers have exploited this situation to say mm -hmm. to, to kind of come in and be like we're doing this good thing. So um, yeah, we got to figure this out, y'all. Um, isn't that what you guys are doing after this? You're going to talk about it. So. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> very <answer>. much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I like the comments in here at capitalism. <laughs> Rethink equating with the money. Everyone is worthy of housing. Yeah. And you know, I see things like there's four empty houses in Oakland for every homeless person. And that's just like so heartbreaking and ununderstandable, right? Um, it's, it really makes me think like we, we could do with a reevaluation of like what the thing is. Cause yeah, even I default to a, you know, of like, yeah, how are we gonna do this? But yeah, there's empty houses. I'm a team, Rise and Revolution. Demonetizing our work. Rethink equating worth with money. I like that. Everyone is worthy of housing. Um, I have a question that was, um, that's actually my mom in the chat. I just wanted to- Oh, cute. <laughs> Your mom. <laughs> yes, mom. Um, <laughs> but um, I have a, a message or a, a question that was a um, private message to me. And this actually does touch on a question that I was um, thinking about. Um, but he is asking, can you, or he says, um, can you speak more on the relationship between um, the blood quantum for indigenous people with the work that you are doing? And I also wanted to add in there also, uh, maybe also talk a little bit about, you know, DNA tests and, and all of that, like that whole situation. Um, I know that was, that's a thing that's talked about in, in ethnic studies, um, but it's, I feel like, while the um, inaccuracies and the the harm that DNA tests cause, 
um, is talked about in ethnic studies and, and kind of a little bit more well known. I keep seeing uh, Ancestry.com, um, 20, you know, like all of these um, different DNA testing websites and platforms very much um, prominent in social media and everything. So yeah, blood quantum, DNA testing, love to hear your thoughts on it. Okay. Um, the first part you had asked was around um, blood quantum tribal recognition kind of. And so um, I'm not an expert on this at all. I'm, my family is actually from Bolivia. Um, so I'm not from a US tribe or anything like that. I only know what has been shared with me. And what I'll say is that um, all the federally recognized tribes were created through federal laws. And um, most of them have some kind of way to determine who's a part of their tribe. And a lot of those have a, a blood quantum, which means if you're half, if you're a quarter, if you're an eighth, you belong. And after a certain amount of time, you don't anymore. If you're 16th, if you're 24th, if you're 32nd, um, if you're this kind of mix, if you're that kind of mix, every tribe has a different, a different kind of um, regulation. But um, some people have said like, you know, when blood, when that practice started coming into thing, it was a, kind of like a strategy of genocide because, um, you know, if you don't count certain Indians then there's less Indians, right? Um, so, so not everyone agrees with it, but over time, it has become a main way that some people do define themselves uh, or define membership with a group. Um, uh, there is other ways, there's like historical lists, there's just family groups, there's being known or descendancy. Um, so that's one thing. And, and, and so there's people, for example, with the DNA test, like Elizabeth Warren, who never grew up in a tribe, wasn't related, and she took a test and was like, I'm native, right? Um, does that make her native? I don't know. And then there's people that grew up on reservations that might take a test and maybe their test says they're not native and they can trace their family back three or four generations. And so I'm not sure about the DNA tests. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy around them and people use them to prove things and to not prove things. And, you know, they, I would like to learn more about that. So I'm curious if maybe you guys can send me an article from ethnic studies class that I can read about the things. So those are some initial things that come to mind. Um, I do know that as, as kind of like laws and resources change, some, some people have them kind of uh, push towards changing some of those laws around who gets to be a part of the tribes and who doesn't. And the government has also done that and posed laws from the outside. So it really varies and people have a lot of different opinions about it. Thank you so much, Inez, for sharing all of those wisdoms. Um, yeah, I will send you this article. Um, there's there's one actually by uh, Kim Talbert, I believe, who is Native American. Um, not sure which community she belongs to, um, but yeah, it's and I mean it. All of these blood quantum's and as as you said, it is a form of genocide. It's um, there's another article I think that's called like the like vanishing. Um, vanishing Indian or something like that, but it's it's about how all of this, you know, um, halves and, and full-blooded and whatever, there's, there's it, it implies that there can be like a zero percentage, you know, that ultimately you can dilute native and indigeneity down until there's nothing left. But yeah, I love all the insights that you provided. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Brittany. Thanks, Leila. So we have another question from Seth who asks, what is one thing you wish the average white person could do to support indigenous communities? Honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is talk to other white people. Um, like that's num number one thing you can do. Um, your white people are more likely to listen to other white people sometimes, um, but just be a, be a down ally, be an accomplice, do your, do your part. That's the best. Thank you so much, Seth. And um, there's a really great resource. It's called um, Accomplices Not Allies. It's like a little zine we have. And it's also online, but it kind of shows like how to, the ideas like go beyond even just being an ally, right? Let's learn it together <laughs> as an accomplice is. So. Pay, period. Yeah, give back the land, Avi. <laughs> Pay your land tax, grow your own food. Recommended readings, yes, thank you, Paul. We have tons of resources on our website. Also other kind of like video clips. We have a rematriation resource guide, how to come correct, um, which is just a number of invitations to respect. 
Yes. Oh my gosh, Paula, you're so quick with the links. <laughs> Just on it. We have benefited and continue. We need to contribute back. Thank you, Valerie. Awesome. Well, I think we're getting to the end of our time here pretty close. Um, it's so weird in this format not to see any of the participants, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you guys for being here. <laughs> Yeah, and thank you, of course, for being here and sharing, you know, all this important information, um, kind of uh, to what you were saying about white people talking to white people. I think it's also important for them to not speak for or over indigenous voices, but rather um, more of um, amplifying and uplifting them. And um, I actually have another question. So some people believe we live in a post-colonial war world where colonization no longer exists. And do you think this is a misconception or like in other words, how are indigenous communities still suffering the consequences of colonialism and how is it manifested today? Who thinks that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, who is it? Um, I feel like it's so like, just, I think in that video, the first thing that comes to mind is like literally I work for a tribe whose ancestors are being dug up every week. They're literally, when they're building in condos and they hit a burial, they call her and they say, we found a body. That is active colonization continuing every day. She's not, being not from a federally recognized tribe means they can't even take those ancestral means back. Not having lands means even if they could take them back, there's no place to put them. So it's like that. that is the such a deep and violent reality that's constant. Um, some of the other things that come to mind are like the high rates of homelessness of indigenous people in Oakland, um, every uh, folks on the street, um, you know, just that what I, I remember Janelle saying like we, I think about it every day that land was lost. Like every day I think about the loss of land and just think like what this is the massive trauma and violence that, that indigenous people, not just from America, but from all over the world carry as, um, as just really heavy, right? So um, who says colonization is over? <laughs> I would like to talk about, I have been reading some things about just like the new ways, neo-colonization, just kind of the new ways it appears, it's sneaky. It looks like um, environmentalism sometimes, it looks like, help to other places and it's actually just colonialism again. Um, but that was kind of a rough one to end on y'all. So <laughs> it's 529. Um, I just wanna say, um, I guess for me, like like always throughout it, there's strength and resilience. Look at um, Sigourte, we have four gardens now and two houses, so excited. Um, and I think that we're at a time in the world where there's like this urgency and people are ready for something different. Like there's, it's kind of clear that some of the systems aren't working anymore. Um, and so we hope to be a part of whatever we all build together. And we actually wanted to um, address a question you asked earlier about what our center and college um, or center at the college is doing to, you know, uh, uplift indigenous communities. We actually formed an anti-racist council that whose one of their goals is to make relationships with and connections with tribal communities. And, you know, this conference is our, is how we're trying to really uplift their voices and bring raise awareness for the their struggles and the fight that they're fighting. Um, and again, we want to thank you for being here. Um, do we have any other questions before our time with Ines is over? Thank you guys so much. I want to send you some stickers and swag. So um, email me. Yeah, I just you can give them out to folks and swing by and they can grab some. Thanks for hosting and Karina sends her best regards. Um, hopefully she'll be able to join you in the future.
Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for all your work, Rise and Revolution. See you next time. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. All right. I'm going to sign up. Amazing. Wow. I am just, I'm, I'm really still taking in a lot of the, um, the wisdoms and insights um, and just really powerful sentiments that were shared today. Um, as my mom <laughs> put in the chat, thank you for inspiring our children. Um, and that's, that's absolutely true. I, I feel that I personally feel very much empowered through all of the knowledge that was shared, as well as just inspired and really, um, really impassioned to to continue this change because you know there are some some efforts being made as as Brittany mentioned, um, but it's definitely not adequate. It's not enough at all, um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this organization that that we are from and in the campus. Um, in our in our city, in our county, you know, everywhere, the work is continuing, um, and not, yeah, needs a lot of work. And I just, I really want to thank um, all of our speakers today. There was so much, um, just, just so many amazing things um, that they all shared, from Kathy to Inez just now. I'm representing Sogorea Tay Land Trust. Um, I mean, I, I'm so glad that this is recorded so that I can go back and really um, try to sit with everything because there was just so much that was shared. And I think this was a really um, beautiful way to start off our week-long conference. You know, we're going to be coming back to this space um, and, and sharing knowledge and wisdom with each other every day for the rest of this week. But I think that, um, you know, the way that we structured this conference to begin with climate justice and indigenous resistance was intentional because there is, this is the foundation really for anti-racist, for liberation work. Um, there is no work in, in these social justice fields without first acknowledging that this America is a settler colonial project. All of the lands that we are on, unless you are, as Inez said, one of the very few folks who are actually indigenous to this land, um, we are settlers on stolen land. And, you know, that's, there's different levels to um, different degrees to the implications of what that settler role means. Um, but we nonetheless, in whatever degree of, you know, settler we occupy, um, we all have a responsibility to learn about these issues, to learn about the people whose um, lands we live on, whose stolen lands we live on, and to you know just do our part in making sure that we are leading as pro-indigenous, anti-settler, anti-capitalist um, lives, you know, and really taking action to combat these systems because we can. We have we have the power to do that. Um, both Kathy and Inez shared lots of resources, lots of tools and, and ways to get involved. Um, and I, I hope that you all can go away and can take go away from this conference um, at the end of today and, and sit with these things and hopefully um, you know search up their names, go back to the work that they're doing and and um, yeah just feel inspired and empowered to to create the change and be part of these movements. Um, I'll pass it to Brittany to give us um, some, some next steps and details about tomorrow. Thanks, Layla. Um, yeah, again, big thank you to our speakers who joined us today, um, Kathy and Sogorea Tay Land Trust. Again, we want to encourage you to reflect on exactly whose land we're all on and how our families are reaping the benefits um, at the cost of the Ohlone people's well-being. And we know that this is not exclusive to the Bay Area because as a video that Ines mentioned, um, wherever we are, we are on indigenous land. So thank you all again for joining us, whether you're in person or virtual. Um, and don't forget to join us for the rest of the week. Tomorrow we're going to be covering health perceptions and realities with amazing speakers that include Deshaun Harrison and Thelani Camacho. 
as well as Kiki Rivera from Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, also known as EPIC. And if you're at the viewing party in person, please make sure to clean up after yourself and feel free to stay and help us. Um, but if you're on campus and at the viewing party, please, we encourage you to stay because we, are, we will be um, having a critical dialogue where we'll be reflecting on the speakers and the topics covered. Um, today's viewing party location is in College Heights. So please, if you could join us, that would be awesome. Again, thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you at our sessions for the rest of the week. Thank you, everyone. Take care. See you tomorrow.